We are here with Seth Rogen, and I just want to start off the bat with a question before I forget. It's something from watching the Howard Stern show where you guys loosely talked about it, um, about you walking into the head of Sony's office on MDMA, about <laughs> telling the head of Sony that you didn't want to lie about your movie, The Interview, uh, to the press. And I wanted yeah. to hear more about that, but you and Howard didn't really get into it. Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> uh, I wrote about it. Uh, I wrote a book, and it's in it's 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 described in there uh, pretty uh, thoroughly. But I'm more than happy to to tell the story because um, it is a wild story. Uh, yeah, I was. Um, we had made this film, the interview, and it was very uh, controversial. North Korea had hacked into Sony's uh, servers and ultimately began to threaten uh, acts of violence against movie theaters who uh, showed the film um and it all basically boiled down to this one shot of us uh we blew up kim jong-un's uh head very graphically uh in one shot in the movie um and comedically i would say but graphically um and the studio started to uh wrestle control of this shot specifically away from us um and it had become a news story at this point because uh, there had been emails that were hacked that revealed there was this kind of issue with the shot and um, there was a lot of focus on this shot. And the head of the studio, Michael Linton, um, called me into his office the day uh, of the premiere of the movie. Like, not the premiere when it's supposed to come out, but like the premiere when you have the party and all that. And mm. um, he was like, we're going to change the shot um, and make it that you can't see his head blowing up, and we want you to lie and say that you're okay with it. So if it comes up in the press and people ask you, we want you to just say, like, just to, like, lower the level of controversy with the film, we want you to say that you are okay with us uh, taking this shot out. And he was an intimidating guy, and I was like, sure. Um, and then that <laughs> night uh, was uh, the premiere of the film, and I did, yeah, a lot of uh, MDMA at the premiere is when they tried to have us approve the final shot. Like literally at the after party, a guy from Sony on his phone tried to have us approve like this new shot that they had concocted. And I think it was in that moment. I was like, this is wrong. Like I can't go along with this. Um, and I emailed that night, the head of Michael Linton and was like, first thing tomorrow morning, uh, we should talk. And he's like, great, like fine. 8 AM let's talk. I continued, uh, doing uh mdma throughout the night <laughs> and uh, <laughs> when 8 a.m rolled around i found myself very much still high um from the night before but the meeting was set and i uh i, I didn't want to cancel it and if anything i was probably more emboldened than i would have been and i went in and i told him that we couldn't lie and that i just didn't want to lie to the press and i didn't want to set this precedent that i was going to lie for him or anybody really and um and i thought it was terrible of him to ask me to do it and he was like fine then i guess we won't uh we guess we won't do it <laughs> and so we it all it was still a disaster for many other reasons but yeah that that is the i guess sort of short slash sort of long version of of that story wow, wow. yeah coming in hot <laughs> <laughs> book the other story that i know pharrell would love that's in the book is the beyonce story yeah i mean that was a short story and since then i've gotten to know beyonce a little bit and she's very and i think she had nothing to do with this it was i was yeah, backstage at, at the sure. grammys where i'd never been to the grammys i was introducing eminem uh dr dre and rihanna for their song um, that it must have been 2010, maybe 2011 or something like that. Um, and I got gotten a call that Eminem wanted me to introduce them specifically, and I was like, "You, you don't, you don't say no to that." And so I went to the Grammys where I had never been. It was very strange, much different than any award show I had ever been to. Um, and you can probably attest to this, uh, Pharrell, is that like. At the Oscars or something, there's like one big green room where everyone is together, kind of. And it's like a big party back there. At the Grammys, every artist has their own 
green room essentially and therefore yeah. like this own their own little party and it just serves this theory i have that musicians never want to interact with anyone that they have not like personally selected to interact with for the most part and so i remember going to the grammys and being like oh there's not one party there's like 80 little parties and there, it was decentralized. And so I was just trying to get a drink and I finally got one. And then I saw, I stole one from Bob Dylan's dressing room. I remember. And then I saw, I was backstage about to go on and I saw Beyonce and I'm also not used to celebrities having bodyguards because very few actors, if any have bodyguards, <laughs> but almost every musician has a bodyguard. <laughs> and I remember going up to trying to say hi, to Beyonce having never been to the Grammys and not interacting with that many musicians and as I approached her a bodyguard shoved me away from her so hard <laughs> that I spilt my drink all over myself and at that moment someone came up to me and was like Seth uh, you got to go on stage right now to introduce Eminem and I had to go right then to introduce Eminem and I actually like I'm standing very weirdly as I introduce him because I'm covering up this massive spill that I have uh, on uh, my suit wow. because uh, Beyonce's bodyguard uh, very <laughs> rightfully, I guess, shoved me. I, I, again, I came in hot. Whoa. If there's one thing you learn from this, I come in, I come in too hot. <laughs> Lil Wayne's bodyguard once shoved me once as well. I've been shoved by a few of my uh, favorite musicians' uh, bodyguards over the years. So at the, at the Oscars, you, they have y'all all together? Yeah. That's kinda... Yeah, yeah wow. it's like one room. Wow. Nah, wow. and it's true, and I never really thought about it like that until you just said it. I'm like, man, you're right. And, and the Grammys is like 80 little parties. Like everybody has their own like big jumbo trailer. Yeah. First of all, or it, or there's like a million. I don't know how. I don't know where it was at the Staples Center or whatever. I don't know how they have so many so many dressing rooms, but they really do. And then they're, they're, whatever they can't cover on the inside is like a million outside. trailers outside. A million. But the Oscars, yeah, wow. even the Emmy, Grammy, all the uh, Golden Globes, you're all literally just all sitting in one giant room together. And the backstage at the Golden Globes is tiny. It's like a little one little tiny room. <laughs> like <laughs> it's, it's like it's it, a, it feels like a Vanity Fair party. You're right. But musicians Whoa. are used to a much higher level of accommodation than actors are, I think, in general, uh, is, a, is a theory I have. And just something I've noticed throughout my life is that um, musicians have a, it's a different level of, uh, of lifestyle, I think, than most actors have. <laughs> well, you know what? I would, I, if I had to, like, try to deduce, I think it's, it, it has to do with the fact that, like, you know, people feel like they have more of a connection with the music. The music usually feels much more personal, whereas mm -hmm. like actors mm -hmm. or actresses are, and they, there are some, some of them have some pretty huge fan bases, but they, but they're playing characters, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Where you understand that. These are the, you know, when, when a musician is singing music, the, the you know, the, the fans feel like, yeah. Man, I really know this person. She's talking about me. Yes, like full on. Yeah. Run up on that you. That makes like... sense. I've done that before. With who? Yeah. <laughs> One time, man. <laughs> who'd, who'd you do it to? <laughs> Whose bodyguard that, got with, you? Nah, the bodyguard, but one time, I don't, you, you probably didn't even pick up on it. One time we was together, we was at Nobu, and, the, um, <laughs> and we was in the little room, and Puff came in there. Puff like peeped his head in there and was like, yo, and I'm like, I felt like I know Puff, like, you know, just from <laughs> the music. So it was me, you, H and Tina. It was just us four in there. So he come in there and he, he you know, he, I know him. I feel like this is my man. I've been listening forever. <laughs> so I was like, oh, like he spoke to you, he spoke to everybody, and then he came around the table, he he, he shook your hand, he was like, yo, what's up, for He was just so cool. And then when he got to me, I was like, yo, like, you know what I mean? Smiling, and he was smiling. So then he dapped me up. He was like, I met you before, right? And I was like, of course. <laughs> and then as soon as, soon as I said, of course, I'm like, damn, why the fuck? Why did I say, of course? <laughs> I said, of course. And he looked like, kind of like, all right. And then he, he hugged Tina and then he walked away. And the whole night, I'm like, damn. But you was wailing. I met him before, but of course, it wasn't an of course uh, relationship. It was like, yeah, I suppose it was just like, yeah, we met before. I was like, of course, like, yeah, you my man. Like, we know each other. 
So it was like, from then on, I just like, damn. So then, that was my one time. But you know what? Let me ask you a question. Would you say that you were in a bubble? I was in a bubble. Okay. <laughs> explain, <laughs> ex, explain, explain to Seth what the bubble is, because I want to know if Seth has ever, he has ever caught in a bubble. He definitely got some stories. So listen, the bubble is when you see somebody, or yeah, Who, who's famous, who's famous, and you sort of like what I explained, but you so caught up that you don't know what's going on around you at all. You're just in a bubble, and it's like. So we, we got so many stories where people just do like some of the wildest because they're in the bubble. And so people who are not in the bubble, just seeing you in the bubble is the fun ever. Because so, you're like watching this person get very carried away yes, and like away. start saying some <laughs> certain shit you're saying is not even really true. Yeah, like, like you just I was, I was in <laughs> doing, whatever to, doing whatever to keep the, the conversation going. You yes. might even, hey, let me help you with that. You yes, know, like, yes. <laughs> you know, just you all the kind of shit you that you wouldn't know. do to a complete stranger. But for this person, you're like, oh, man, I'll carry that. No <laughs> yes, problem. You know? yes. No problem. Like, hey, yo, hey. And then. Hey, what's going on? You're not going to eat that? I'll eat that. <laughs> <laughs> if you're lucky, if you're lucky, your friend could pop your bubble. So we like, yo, get him out of there. You got to get him out the bubble. It's just like, he going too far. Because he's embarrassing himself. <laughs> yeah, he going too far. So like, in my case, when I was like, of course, I popped my own bubble. Like, yo, what the f you don't know him like that. <laughs> <laughs> so normally, somebody would keep going. Like, I would have been like, of course. So what you up to? Where you living at now? What's your phone number? That's yeah. the bubble. I would have kept going. And Pharrell thought I would have been like, yo, what bruh, the hell? Like, bro, stop. Yeah. yeah. Yo, what's going on? You eating here? What's up? For me, the bubble is very specifically people want to smoke weed with me. That and, and that's uh, me and and me oh, and Snoop yeah. have t and uh, me and Snoop have talked a lot about that bubble because he has a similar bubble and we've really commiserated over like it's a real problem. Is like everyone <laughs> wants to smoke weed with us. Like Yo. it's just it's just it's all everyone wants to do. And like I would love to smoke weed with everyone who wants to smoke weed. But I just can't. I literally and now there's 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 COVID. Yeah, there's dude. diseases. Like I now like as much as I didn't want. To before I really cannot do it now and also everyone gets too high no one can handle it which is another thing that me and Snoop have like we, we were Man. talking about like, like how many times we just found ourselves like stuck with someone who's too high who like thought they could <laughs> hang and they just can't hang and they, and, and they wish they could hang but they just can't hang and they think they can and they're like I want to smoke and then they take two or three hits and you're just like I'm just, I've, I've ruined this person. I'm stuck with them. I'm responsible for them now. I'm stuck with so them. like, yeah, that 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 happens to me all the time. It's happened to me so many. But I've been caught up. Yeah, I've found myself in the bubble uh, uh, a few times with yeah comedians that I look up to, things like that. Uh -huh. I have to. I get very nervous and weird around. Uh, so what is it? Around. Is it like the girl that you're with? Is a girl that which girl that you're with is kind of like, damn, babe, you know, you kind of got carried away, like you yeah, know. like. That won't you <laughs> Babe, you like it's totally. Like you got loud. Yeah, like. Uh, <laughs> Who's your bubble <laughs> popper? Is it your wife loud. or your writing partner? I'm a, yeah, my wife, I'm a wife. She will pop my bubble, definitely. And she will be like, what, what is wrong babe, with you? Got you? you got loud. <laughs> That's it. That's the best, babe. You got loud. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She'll be like, yeah, yeah. She, she'll tell me I'm loud. You'll, she'll say you were being loud. That was loud. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's the bubble. That's the which is a thing that happens. You, you get, you get rolling. Like Come back. Yeah. Oh, so sometimes cool. she's just like, you thought you were real funny tonight. That was <laughs> <laughs> Yo. Who, who who are some of the comedians that you met where you were just like kind of starstruck? I if I had to guess, it would probably be Steve Martin, but um, yeah, I've met him a few times and I was for sure struck. Adam Sandler the first time I met him. Um mm -hmm. You know, Chris Rock, the times I've been, hey, I've gotten to meet him and hang out with him. I mean, it's like anyone who I grew up, Bill Murray, though, is like the one that I oh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Goat. I Goat like look up, I look up to the most and for sure get the most nervous around. And, uh, and, my wife like hates hearing me talk about how, <laughs> how like just uh, how nervous I get around him and how I just want to make him laugh and how in the past I was around him and I tried to make him laugh and it didn't go as well as I wanted it to and then for the next week all I would talk about is how I like tried to make him laugh and it didn't work like yeah she's she's sick of that for sure. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's actually an interesting dynamic to think about because other musicians when they get around musicians they look up to don't necessarily have instruments in their hands where they can perform, but a comedian no, yeah. has access to their their instrument, they're and oh, yeah, they're right. almost expected to spar with their with the people they think is you know they look up to. 
Yeah, some do. Sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. And I mean, I've been in situations where I've actually had to perform in front of comedians I look up to and do poorly. So it's also it's it's it is like a musician with their instruments in front of another yeah. musician, like uh, completely f***ing up. That's also happened. Um, yeah, it's tough out there. They said you started comedy at thirteen. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. That's amazing that you had the courage to do that. Like, what it, what does that mean? A 13-year-old comedian, bro. Like, that's crazy. I would go to stand-up comedy clubs and bars that had uh, open mic nights and stuff like that. And my mom would drive me because I didn't have a driver's license. I'm from Vancouver, which is, like, a big city, which is helpful. Like, it had, like, an actual comedy scene. There was, like, four or five places that had, like, full rooms full of audiences wanted to see comedy every week. So... Um, that was a real advantage, I think. But yeah, it's from when I was around 13, I would go to comedy clubs and perform from when I was around, or when I was around 15, I kind of would headline the clubs around Vancouver. Wow. Um, and then I got cast on Freaks and Geeks when I was like 16. Um, and I got the agent through doing stand up comedy. Um, mm. And, uh, <clears throat> but yeah, I started. Very, very, very young. And I, my parents encouraged me. I think that was part of it is I was like a funny kid and I said I wanted to do stand-up comedy and my parents, God bless them, were like, okay, we'll help you try to do that. Not like, that's insane. Uh, don't do <laughs> yeah, that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's amazing, man. That's amazing, I man. just, you know what? I you know what I always, always loved? I, I've always loved about your style is it's, it's very highbrow. It's like intelligent, mm-hmm. like... Um, it's like very highbrow comedy. Um, and I almost feel like you use comedy as a vehicle to sort of like talk about very specific dialed in subjects. Yeah. Yeah. You you know? No, for sure. I'll never forget when I first saw like, um, you know, super bad. And I just was like, this is this is giving me like all the vibes of like how I grew up. Yes, man. And and you know, because I, I guess t- comedy was changing, right? It was coming out of that time where like Fabulous mm-hmm. People's Day Off and John and Cusack. you know, uh, yeah, John Cusack and oh, all of yeah. his one crazy summers and all of those st- that yeah, style. Yeah. And then like when we saw this, it was like, oh, this is like comedy. It has just, it's just as funny as like, yeah. you know, watching National National Lampoon's Vacation. Oh yeah, class. But it's, but it's like, Karen. or Fast Times at Ridgemont High, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. it had all of that, but there was like a, a, a there was a highbrow standard mm-hmm. to the subject matter. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, almost yeah. like the, the brilliance comes in like, in a scene like between the the dialogue, the little nothings are like yeah, super yeah. intelligent. And that's what those films back. That's what we loved about those films back then. Yes, man. Yeah. Like just like the regular, it, it, not even the biggest part of the the scene. Nah, it's like the stuff you're saying under your breath, yeah. or like the 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 B or C conversations in the room, are are so fucking smart and pipe, like pipe down, very very yeah very poignant. <laughs> But it's just, I don't know, man. I, I just appreciate what it is that you do. And I feel like you guys Thank ushered you. in a whole world after that. What were some of the movies you grew up on, man, like that you loved? Like ones that she, he named was like some of our favorites. Like what was like your inspiration? I grew up watching a lot of um, of those movies, uh, jo- all the John Hughes movies, Ferris Bueller's Day Off and The Breakfast Club. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. I think I think those looking back were some of the first movies to... Breakfast Club is a very poignant movie and a very emotional movie. Mm-hmm. You know, I know he's like a monstrous pervert, but my parents were big Woody Allen fans. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> you know, uh, and it, 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 he is a disgusting person from what it seems. But some of those films, honestly, were very influential and um, and and did have a very good balance of um, comedy and drama. Um, and mm-hmm. um, in a way that. Uh, was influential on me. I can't. I can't deny it. You know. Um, and then when I was in high school is when we started writing Super Bad, and um, that's when films like Rushmore were coming out, um, mm-hmm. and we loved that. And yes. Yes. Um, 
and and yeah, Wes Anderson was first starting to make movies, and there was and also there was movies like American Pie coming out, which we thought were funny, but we also thought really had like a poor set of values to them in 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 a lot yeah. of ways. And they missed, they, I think they that missed was the memo. something. Yeah, and that was something we were reacting to as well. Is like we felt like there was this kind of like normalization of like gross behavior, movies like Porky's Revenge of the Nerds, which were also movies we grew up watching, uh, but they're movies that yeah. are like, just like disgusting and they treat women yeah. terribly, you know? Yeah. Um, and well, that was, and that was something that we were reacting to was like, we were always taught to be very respectful of women, but society was kind of like inundating us with stuff that was kind of showing us the opposite in a lot of ways, especially the type of movies we liked. And that was part of what we thought was really interesting was how do we like infuse our values in this type of movie that we also mm -hmm. like. And to us, that's always been, I mean, I think that's what's amazing about comedy is you can convey the deepest, darkest of messages with it. There is no idea that you can't convey with comedy. And it's honestly, you know, why I am frustrated by with film, especially like drama is the genre that is most acclaimed when to me in many ways it is the most it just is what it is like to make a sad movie about a sad thing mm -hmm. is like, you know, it's like printing. It's like, it's like a pretty painting of a sunset. It's like, yeah. it's great. Like you, you, you painted something pretty and it's pretty, you know, um, <laughs> yeah. to me, yeah. like, I don't know if that's the most interesting, like creative exercise for my brain, you know, to take something yeah. incredibly sad and make something incredibly sad out of it or make, take something that I am feel angsty or anxious about and to make an angsty anxious product like what we found is that we could take these feelings we had of terror and insecurity and um yeah. just and, and and make something really funny out of it and really pleasurable out of it and 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 still include all those feelings but make something that overall the effect was uh like an uproarious one and once we saw that that was possible it just seemed like the hardest bullseye to hit and not to say that we don't produce other things or make other types of things but to me i will never respect anything more than something that is really funny about something that is really not funny like to me that is like the hardest thing to achieve that i've seen out there in a lot of ways and it's and and it's and i've seen people do it and it's possible and and it's amazing when it happens and and it's a cathartic experience when it happens because i think it tells you as the viewer that there is light levity in in even the most uh you know terrible of of circumstances that you can extract something good out of even the worst of things and, and you're proving that by creating laughter out of something that is inherently painful, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And that's why people like it, you know? Um, but it's by far the least respected uh, form of uh, art, almost uh, in the world total, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> you can actually, I mean, you can actually get away with more if you do the comedy right with, um, you know, discussing painful things. Yeah, I much think. more. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we made this movie Sausage Party that is about religion yes. and and how organized religion we feel is like a com is a construct that, you know, spirituality is great, but we feel the organized religion has many constructs that are very repressive towards a lot of people. That would yeah. be a hard movie to make if it wasn't also about food each other like the yeah, comedy man. is what allowed us to make it with a lot of one. money and to get no. um no. a lot of people to go see it if it was yeah, just like a straightforward all. movie about like the confines of the repressive aspects of organized religion like no one would want to watch that and no one would give us the money to make that you know yeah <laughs> with that message that was that was brilliant by the way with that message too but the last Five minutes of sausage party time. <laughs> <laughs> listen, man. You know, <laughs> listen to me. You never see like this. No, never. And it yeah. was so off guard. 
They called me Suave God. I mean, it was funny. You know, his humor is amazing. So I'm, we laughing the whole movie. The last five minutes, man, just go left. <laughs> and it just gets crazy. And you, it's so crazy that you ain't going to leave. But I was like, yo, I felt crazy, man. Like, <laughs> you had, I know you done it on purpose. What? <laughs> let me know you done. <laughs> I told my mom to watch it. Man. No way. Yes, man. But I, oh, like no. <laughs> it's good. It's a good movie. It's good. Like you it said, you got the spirituality. It's good. But the last, is it, how, yeah. how long is, is the last five or ten minutes? It's around, it's it's between that. It's maybe six or seven minutes. Or seven, but man, yeah, we, we, turn, we turn it up to 11 in the last few they minutes. They turn it up to 1,000. <laughs> and immediately, it's like, it's no, it's no warning or nothing. It's like, yo, you happy? You happy? And then it was good. Then it just go crazy. <laughs> it is at the end. So if you leave, you've you've got the you've got you've got what happens ultimately. Yeah, if you leave, if you leave, you good, you happy. But if you miss this part, you will have no idea what happened. Like you, it's, like it's wild. People that people that's listening right now, if they left it. They left before this. They don't know what I'm talking about. But the ones who stayed, you know. one of our crowning achievements. <laughs> yes, man. That was wild, but that was good. That was good. Thank you for that, man. You gotta see it, bro. Okay. My pleasure. You see it. But but you got you listen. You gotta oh, be ready for it. You got to be ready. <laughs> it, <laughs> Two it tears down a lot of walls, is all I can say. <laughs> you said it took it to eleven. That's one thousand. Yeah. It's probably one of the most mainstream movies that's ever been made critiquing organized religion. And I think that, like, because it's counterbalanced with such a silly, like, uh, you know, uh, outward appearance, we're, we're, they, they, they let us do it. But, um, yeah, like, to what you're saying, we really try to make them as engaging to us as, as anything, you know? And we want our movies to include, like, the ideas that we think are interesting we're talking about to each other you know when we're hanging out like um and just because yeah it's about food uh you know there's a food orgy in it doesn't mean it can't also uh have a lot of intelligent <laughs> ideas <laughs> yeah yeah y'all yeah, nailed it man no point but it was good y'all <laughs> nailed it wow <laughs> they definitely nailed it but um so you said like stuff that you'd be talking about like is that like a process for you like just kicking it with your friends and then you'd be like oh that that could be a good movie or that, that yeah. can be a part in a movie. That's how you be, you like. I mean, I'm sure it's the same thing, like a song or something, like a tune just kind of appears in your head one day. Like, um, that's like, some days it'll just kind of, you get an idea. And to us, you know it's a good idea if it like sticks around. Like some ideas, you, you'll you have it in the morning and by dinner you're like, ah, it was stupid. Some ideas you have it in the morning and then the next week you like, find yourself still thinking about it and the next week you find yourself still thinking about it and you're writing notes about it and you have and you're like oh my god like I've actually a few pages of ideas for this thing now and those are the ideas that are the ones that become things and and it is kind of like a darwinistic um philosophy in that like it takes a long time to make a movie, like years and years and years and years, like from when you conceive of it to when it's finished. Even on the shortest timeline, it takes several years. And on the average timeline, I'd say it takes like five years. And so if you're going to be working on something for five years, like you better really like it, like really like it. Like you better think it's like such a great idea that like your life will not be the same as it would have been if you did not, get it out into the world basically and anything short of that is not a good enough idea to turn into a movie <laughs> um because it just it it takes too much time honestly and so like that that's really our process is like if we think of something and years later we're still talking about it we we try to turn it into a movie basically and like every idea we're working on now is like from a few years ago basically and it means that it's stuck around you know do you have like um like if you're walking around and you see something like a situation and you think it's funny do you have like a separate note like a separate uh, notes file for um like oh that was a funny scene i can probably put that somewhere and you write down what happened or is everything sort of inspired by the idea uh of, of what the screenplay is about I'm usually working on enough things that if something happens that's 
I c- it'll it'll organically belong somewhere. You know mm. what I mean? Um, yeah. Or I'll get a new idea. Sometimes I'll have a new movie idea. That is a file I have. New movie ideas. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, yeah, I would say those are just kind of more general ideas. But uh, yeah, often something will happen. I'll be like, oh. I'm working on Ninja Turtles. That'll be good in Ninja Turtles. Oh, I'm working yeah. on this thing. That'll yeah. be good in this thing, you know? Um, yeah. Are you working on Ninja Turtles? I am working on Ninja Turtles. I'm producing uh, uh. a new animated uh, Ninja Turtle movie um, for Paramount. Oh. Wow. Hit it, hit it I know, first. it's awesome. Um, it's Turtles. super exciting. And we're, it's the first, it's, we're gonna, it's funny, if you think about the Ninja Turtles, they've never actually cast teenagers ever to be the Turtles, and that, that is one of our big ideas, is that, I mean, it's animated, so it's just voices, but they will be voiced by actual teenagers, and it's like a high school movie, um, is what we're very inspired by, uh, yeah. And man, you gotta put the shredder in there, man. (laughs) Everyone loves shredder. (laughs) That's cool, though, I know that's exciting, man. What else are you working on? Yeah, Ninja Turtles. We have the show The Boys that the third season is about. Uh, we just finished shooting. Um, we uh, have just have a spinoff for that. Um, I just finished shooting a Steven Spielberg movie, which was very crazy. Um, I, I, uh, we're producing a movie um, that's currently called The Joy club i don't know if that will ultimately be what its title is because <laughs> if you google that just a lot of porn comes up currently um but uh yeah we have uh, a few movies that we're producing um several tv shows uh a lot of things um things are going well you, um, thank god you, you, you got a podcast coming up too right yeah, I started my own podcast as well, um, which has wow. been awesome. I've been I've enjoyed it. It's not like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's cool, man. Wait, let me ask you a question, man. Where is McLovin? Where is McLovin? Crispin's boss yeah. is in a band in uh, in California. He lives in L.A. Oh, wow. I talked to him pretty. He's actually in a Promising Young Woman, that movie that came out last year that got a lot of very good attention. He has a small role in that. Um, but yeah, he's uh, he's in a band. Uh, How a did you guys bands. cast him? Yeah, he was lit. We found him in a high school. Um, we gave like notices to uh, drama teachers in high schools around uh, ca- the California area. He's from like uh, like the Chatsworth area or Northridge, I think. Um, and the funny, I mean, the story from him is it's like we gave like a description of like we're looking for like a scrawny kid with a lot of confidence, <laughs> someone who thinks they're cool but kind of isn't cool, um, someone who would be picked on and not understand why they're getting picked on because they think that they're cooler than the people picking on them. Um, and we sent that description to like drama teachers around high school. And from Chris's perspective, it was like literally like one of his friends came up to him in the hall was like, I got this piece of paper that describes you exactly on it. You should go wow. audition for this movie um and and that was him yeah and he came in and what's funny is jonah so he read with jonah hill and michael Sarah, who um were already cast and yeah. jonah hated him like jonah couldn't stand him and like was getting so no aggravated by him because he wasn't an actor and he had never acted before they were improvising a lot and he was like stepping all over jonah's lines and he was being really disrespectful honestly to jonah <laughs> in general and it was driving jonah crazy but to us it was so funny and i remember afterwards jonah was like cast anyone but that kid like i hated him and we were like what you don't get is like that's what makes it funny and the more you don't like him the more this is actually a hilarious dynamic um McLovin, and we cast him because of that yeah mclovin wow he's a great you gotta actor. bring him back <laughs> you gotta bring him back for something else yeah, yeah i know he pops up uh every now and then but yeah his that's voice based on my actual his, friend his voice and you know his whole like energy is just like funny but his voice i mean he could do voiceovers like at that it's just it's he he's 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 got a, a different cool. voice he does. Yeah, I think he's in those How to Train Your Dragon movies also. I'm not 100% sure, but he's uh, oh, wow. he works. He's a working actor. Oh. He, he's, uh, okay, he's around. Great. Yeah, great. He, did, he didn't vanish into McLovin obscurity. He, he, he kept going. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And, and, and super bad. My favorite part, man, was when him and Jonah was talking and the car hit Jonah. <laughs> <laughs> I laughed for like three 
three days straight behind it. Like, I don't know. That's my favorite part of the whole movie. I love the movie, but when he was just talking and he got hit, he was like, what the? <laughs> and he's hit like really weirdly. It kind of just like hits his butt. Yeah, like, it was like like, <laughs> like, like like shoves him forward a little. Yeah, <laughs> Yo, I yeah we Dave we have a lot. Man. It's like one of those things you look back at your own work and you it, it informs what you like. And it's not even something that you would have said, but like you like like the the proof doesn't lie. And I look back yeah. and like. Clearly, I think it's funny when people get hit by cars because there's a lot of Yo, people man. getting hit by cars in our movies. I just, I, I clearly think it's funny. I enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, man. I'm guilty too, man. I'm guilty too because I crap. Yeah. <laughs> what the fuck? It's like, what the fuck? <laughs> he gets hit by several cars throughout the course yes, of the movie. Yeah. <laughs> Shout out to Joe, man. What's going on with your weed company? Uh, Houseplant? Um, it's going very well. Um, oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Houseplant. Thank Man, you. Man, tell everybody one more time, what is the name Great. of your brand, bro? Wow. It, it's called Houseplant. Um, we sell both weed. It comes in these little tins. This is our... Uh, these are our... They stack on top of each other, which is also fun. Um, <laughs> this is our indica, sativa, wow. and hybrid. Um, we also make uh, like home goods for people who smoke weed: uh, ashtrays, lighters, table lighters, um, things like that. Um, you can go to houseplant.com. It's all available there. If you're in California, you can buy our weed. This is a thing we made. It's a car lighter that is literally just like embedded in a block of um, marble. Uh, mm. And you put and you, it's it's a wonderful thing. It, it sits on my desk, um, and you literally just push down the button, um, and uh, it'll pop oh, up. Like the and car you can, yeah, I mean it's uh, it's like those wow. old school car lighters that because that's uh, amazing. Uh, basically, basically, I lose my lighter all the time, and so I was like, I need a lighter that can sit on my desk that I can plug in and that I'll never lose, and uh, that's what this. Wow. Is. That's <laughs> That's true, yo. That's so good. That's amazing. That's true. Yeah, it's yeah but by the way, that's a yeah. that's a high that's a high thought, right? Definitely. A super high thought that translates Definitely. very very well. Um, <laughs> wouldn't it be cool if we just had a car lighter in a block of marble? And then the answer is yes, yes. It <laughs> by would the be. way, your your um, your home. What, what did you say? Your home. Um, you said you guys have home. We have home goods. Uh, home goods. For, yeah, your 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 home goods division or department should be called high thoughts. I thought, <laughs> well, I if you go to our website, it's house and plant, and there's the house side and the plant side. So the house plant Yo, actually uh, works wow. in two sides. Wow. <laughs> what kind of weed we, is that? Wow. It's good. We have matches house like plant. that. I can send you. Uh, I'll send you. Nice. Um, <laughs> That's <laughs> amazing. All sorts of nice stuff. That's yeah. genius, no, it's, bro. It, He's got a lot of cool stuff on there, Farrell. You should check it out. Because they don't make nice stuff for people who smoke weed. Uh, and, like, I wanted nice ashtrays and lighters and stuff like that and found myself just, like, buying things that were made in, like, the 50s and 60s. And I was like, why don't people make, you know, new stuff uh, for people who smoke weed that want to have lovely, beautiful things in their home and don't want to be, like, ashing into a mug? Um, you know, like, I use an ashtray all day, every day. Like, I realized, like, I use an ashtray almost more than any object in my home. So part of me was like, I want a really lovely ashtray if I'm going to be using it all the time. <laughs> um, and a lot of people are like that. And I think people who smoke weed have been very like not considered over the years, obviously. Um, and so it's nice to make things uh, that are nice for people who smoke weed because they deserve nice things too. <laughs> and I call that is dope. That's crazy. That's amazing. And I do my own ceramics. So I started making my own ashtrays and then we started making ashtrays like based on my designs as well um and i started making these ashtrays that mm -hmm. like hold the joint on these little rests okay. and stuff like that um and yeah. <laughs> yeah and it's uh and so yeah we started like that's how few good ashtrays there are is i literally had to learn to make ceramics and make my own that's like wow. the need i had for for good ones and so um, yeah, people seem to really like them so we started uh producing like small batches of them basically <laughs> And do That's you amazing, curate man. the weed that you sell, or do you guys grow, yes. you, you grow it? We curate it. It's it's from growers that some are growers I've been smoking some for years. Some are people that we are just uh, meeting now. But I personally select every strain that we sell. 
Um, I smoke a ton of it before we sell it. Um, we only have big, giant buds in our tins. Like, we are super high uh, standards on, like, what we're, uh, you know, putting in the tins and what we're putting out to the world. Like, it's really only the weed that I personally uh, would be thrilled to be smoking. And we want it that when you open one of our little tins, you're like, holy, that's some big, nice, <laughs> awesome buds, you know? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> So it's nice. Man. I know. What a time. <laughs> you, you're going to, I think the next wave is uh, the micro dosing for shrooms. So you're going to have to start making stuff for that. Yeah, I've been doing that a little bit recently. I think that's something that uh, people for sure are going to be getting more and more on the bandwagon on. I've been doing shrooms since I was 13 years old. So I think, so. yeah, I'm. I'm... <laughs> have, you try, have you tried the gummy shrooms yet? I have. I've tried the gummy. I tried the little pills. I tried the chocolates that are dosed out. Um, yeah, I've tried every form of shroom. Uh, there what, is. <laughs> what, what what does uh, uh, micro dosing shrooms? What does what does that unlock for you? Um, for me, honestly. I, I I just started trying it a few, like a month ago maybe, is when I actually first started like experimenting with it. For me, it just makes me feel a little bit like I'm on shrooms, honestly. <laughs> like, it, it doesn't, um, I don't I don't have like depression or, pe you know, like I don't have like some clinical thing that I'm trying to overcome uh, in some way, which I think is what it's uh, very useful for in a lot of people, is if you're mm -hmm. taking some sort of other medication that you're trying to supplement it with, you know, um, or replace it with, if you have PTSD or something like that, trauma, you know, um, things like that. Uh, I'm just like a guy who likes drugs, so I, I to me, I don't know if it's like doing necessarily what it's uh, <laughs> like. Uh, the therapeutic element of it is is less. It, it definitely is a mood booster. It feels good to be on a little bit of shrooms all the time for me. Um, but uh, I was actually told by a neurologist recently um, that because of how many shrooms I did when I was growing up, uh, and in high school, it for sure rewired my brain uh, permanently. <laughs> wow. So, I, so I don't know if uh, so. Uh, yeah, it's all just gravy on top of the the mashed potatoes at this point. <laughs> Can you act when you're high or on, uh, on shrooms or anything? No, that's an I, I would never. I would not try that. That that seems like there's because sh shrooms have a high margin of error. You know what I mean? Like, uh, I, if if you find yourself suddenly on too much shrooms, that's a real bad situation. If you have to be functional in any real capacity, you know, um, like it, if you're too high on shrooms, you're useless. You know, um, and so no, I would not do that just in case there was a miscalculation you know? <laughs> <laughs> but what about what about weed can you can you act on weed have you ever for sure yes i almost Definitely exclusively yeah. uh, act when i'm smoking i smoke weed all the time so um you know what i mean so you're one of those people that can smoke weed and your memory's great yes yep. Pretty so good. what? <laughs> i don't know if i'd say so great what, <laughs> so 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 what have you heard because for the longest time, I'd never known there was anything that could like bring you down if you're like, let's say you, you've had a sativa, right? They mm -hmm. say that yeah. you can essentially have uh, CBD and it'll bring you down. Is that true? Wow, I don't know. That's a good, I find it, whenever I someone know. gets too high, I tell them just eat a lot of food. Honestly, I find food brings you down. Oh yeah, 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 and, ch and chocolate, <laughs> chocolate, chocolate. They say chocolate, right? Yeah, probably nah. chocolate. No, things for like real, that. chocolate. Um, things that just kind of like overpower the, the receptors he, in your brain just... that are high. No, I was about to say, like he said, it's, I don't think nothing brings you down but sleep. No, they said food, I'm telling you. I see, every food time does somebody help. always, help. No, no. I've it... been super high and none of that <laughs> worked. Like, none of that <laughs> me down. So Nothing believe... will turn it off like a switch, I don't think. That, that no, time not is turn the it only off, thing. but it'll take the edge off if you're, like, way For too sure. high. It take the edge off. Like, you know, like, heart pumping high. fast and heart beating fast. You got to eat, like, sweets and, I'm telling you, chocolate. I, listen, I was high, and he know about this. I was so high <laughs> that I ate my whole mini bar in, what was it, Amsterdam? I ate, like... I ate everything in a mini bar. Now, you know, in Europe, overseas, what they have, they have all type of shit. Never even seen before. 
candies I never seen. I drunk everything. I drunk all of the the the, em, the energy drinks. I drunk everything. <laughs> My bar bill was like four hundred dollars the next day, and I was still high. I was high for like three days. I'm not for none of that. Like, well, they told edibles. Me to, was it an edible or did you smoke weed? It was an edible. It was a space. There's case. your problem. That's, That's there. I, there it is. <laughs> Edibles, I you will say, like with edibles, I don't, I barely fuck edibles. Almost I'm never doing that again. Never. Like, I might be that still is high. A that was whole, three years ago. I, of all the drugs I've done in, it, it done in my life, I think the only time I've been like, I am way too high is from eating weed food. Like, I've, and I've done a lot of various drugs in a lot of high quantities, and the only time I've been like, I wish... This would stop yes, was after yes, eating yes. a weed brownie. Yes. There's been times where I'm like, this is a lot. This is crazy. This is a li- I'm teetering on the edge here. But the only time I've been like, I wish this would just end has been from eating a weed brownie, man. Weed brownies will f*** up. Uh, another thing I've talked to Snoop about at length, he doesn't eat that either. You can't f*** with that. Oh, yeah. It's See, like it's a whole other thing. I don't know what that it is. is, but that that it's is a whole zone, other yo. thing. Because <laughs> <laughs> there's the no real science. Life. It's like you don't know what's happening when uh, everything like you just know you f-ed up. That's all you know. I f-ed up. And it's like no, yeah, you know you f-ed up. You know you're going down a bad path. Yeah, like the only time I was I I was once at the Golden Globes and I ate a weed lollipop and. And I don't know Brian Cranston well at all. <laughs> and I and I saw him uh, at the party, and the first thing he said to me was like, "What's wrong with you?" And I was just like, "Oh no!" <laughs> like, like I got like, like to, to say that to someone you don't even know that well. Like, I must have looked terrible. Yeah, and and I well. went home immediately. I like literally like got in the car and left. I was like, "I gotta Yo. get out of here." But it was all a weed lollipop. That that. Yeah. Well, I don't even know what it did. It, it, it made me look alarming. <laughs> <laughs> I'm never eating again, man. Ever. I don't, I don't. And I ate chocolate. So, so, but you're saying it works when you smoke. That's how you bring it down. No, period. No, it don't work when you eat. I'm telling you. Do not listen. There's no remedy for when you eat. You have to go to sleep. <laughs> Once my dad ate a giant weed brownie that uh, by accident, and my dad does not smoke weed, and he thought he was dying. <laughs> like he literally, like, yeah, and like, my mother called me, was like, "There's something wrong with your father," and I was like, "Oh no!" And then we slowly deduced that he ate a weed brownie from my refrigerator, yeah. and then he thought he was having like a stroke or something like that. Of course, and like that, like that's like yeah, that's a bad you, drug. Yeah, you have it all. And why do you gotta feel like there's something wrong? Why you can't just be too high and be like, damn, I'm, I feel like I'm flying? Or it's just a different drug. No, you always feel like something do. wrong. Yeah, other, uh, yeah, too much. Yeah, like a lot of other drugs, too much of it, you just feel even better. But weed food, too much of it, it's like, oh no, I'm gonna feel like this forever and, and it's terrible. <laughs> yeah. I would have called the police. We was in Amsterdam, man. I didn't know what it was. It? If I knew what the hospital was at, I would have went to the hospital. I would have left. But wouldn't nobody tell me. You got to find the right weed for you. It's different for everybody, you know. I think that's the yeah. I think that's that's the key. It's a, it's not it's not a one, but the, you know, it's a long life. You can experiment. You can find uh, you can find what works for you. Luckily. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully I'll be to find some one day. <laughs> Try our indica. It's great. We have a few flavors. What music? What's like your go-to? My go-to music is definitely like 60s soul music, I would say, uh, and 90s rap music. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, yeah. Gangsta. Are uh, probably the two types of music I listen to the most. Um, and what are, you, what, are your, what are your favorite, like, name your top five 60s soul artists? Oh, man. Um, I love, like... Uh, like the Delphonics, I really like Dion Warwick. Oh, wow. I uh, I really, wow. really, really like. She has all these records of covers that are just uh, incredible. I have a lot of those. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, her Burt uh, Bacharach stuff is crazy. Yeah, yes, insane. Mm-hmm. All that her Unchained Melody, all that stuff is it's so incredible. Um, 
I'm a big Tina Turner fan. Um, wow. Wow. I love, uh, yeah, and I love like a lot of like the Detroit like soul uh, music. Obviously, you know, um, all that stuff's uh, absolutely incredible. Um, and uh, and I think yeah, it's like what my parents grew up listening to. You know, also like even old like fifties like like doo wop and all, a lot of that stuff. I really love. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, all like the girl kind of like the the various uh, you know pointer sisters and things like that um, yeah all that stuff I really 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 love um, I think it, yeah it's because it's what my parents listen to for the most part and then in high school you know I started high school in 1995 um, which is when all these amazing albums were coming out uh, mm-hmm. Tribe Wu Tang you know um de la soul uh like the roots um like we were obsessed with all that stuff and um just uh, kind of like devoured all of it as it came most deaf all that stuff flip coolie you know um yeah it was funny because we were in vancouver i don't know why how it <laughs> why, why it spoke to us so much but it but it really That's did dope. That's dope. That's dope. this episode what? is gonna have all that music yeah, yeah, Great. We'll definitely put that in. <laughs> when was the last yeah, yeah. time you discovered some new music, whether it was new or old, that you know had an impression on you? Um, like a new artist. It doesn't uh, have to be a new artist. It could be just new to you, like what something that you discovered recently that you were like, oh, I, I like this artist. Um. I mean, I like, I do listen to new music as well. And that, that I did, like, I, I like that Olivia Rodrigo album because it reminded me of, honestly, a lot of the 90s music I grew up listening to. Mm. Like, I do try to listen to the new popular music that people are listening to as well, just to be aware of what's happening, you know? Mm. Um, I did love Kanye's new album. Uh, mm. To me, Kanye is just such a unique, uh, like, artist. And, like, it, to me, it's so, uh, like, I think, like, I think what he does is really interesting. I think like the fact that it's such a distinct sound, it's so, you can just turn on any song for half a second and kind of know it's a Kanye song. I think like, it's like as auteurish um, as a performer as I think a lot of performers are. And that's just something I think is really interesting, you know, that that he can carve out a, a sound that uh, is so unique. Um, so yeah, I think, uh, and I'm also fascinated by how he keeps getting me to like him again. I, I, I'm, I'm interested in how, I'm interested in how he makes me feel about myself, honestly. <laughs> I, I think that is an interesting journey that I keep getting taken on, um, is that I, I can like look there and be like, what the f- is this guy talking about like how how men how how much stupid stuff can come out of someone's mouth and then be like I love this album it's incredible I'm gonna listen to it for two weeks straight and not and not stop you know um I think that is I'm fascinated by that as well you know um and 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 I like that in in a lot of ways you know (laughs) I wonder how much of it is intentional me too I, I wonder, truly. I, I mean, I think, again, sometimes you look back and realize you did a thing you didn't even realize that you did it, you know? Um, or sometimes you're very aware of the fact that you're doing it. Uh, I, I truthfully don't know. <laughs> well, speaking as a Gemini, I feel like it's all intentional. Oh, um, all intention. Geminis don't really have a lot of uh, random acts they say you like uh heard heard you like reality TV too, man. What you what you watching? What's some of your favorites? Oh man, I watched 90 Day Fiance a lot. Hey man, that's my <laughs> joint. <laughs> that's, it's great. Yeah. It's insane. Is it really? The other way? Do you do you watch the other way? I watch all of them. The entire 90 Day uh, verse, whatever the 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 the, the 90 Day Fiance verse, <laughs> the 90 Day Cinematic Universe. Um, yeah. Uh, to me, I think I've thought about why I like reality TV so much, and I think it's why, like, I don't watch sports, and I think instead of sports, I watch reality television. Like, I think that is my sports. <laughs> is like, it, it's like it's sports. I am I, I am an observer. <laughs> I am rooting for certain things to happen. They don't always happen, but it, but it, but I think most importantly, like, it's not what I do for a living. Also, like, I think like often like TV and movies are not relaxing for me to watch because 
it's like they're too engaging. Like if it's yeah, good, yeah. all I'm thinking of is like, oh, yeah, this is good. Like, oh no, like what yeah. could I be learning from this or absorbing from this or what is this person doing? And if it's bad, I'm just like hypercritical of it. And just like, oh, like what, like what the, f what a wasted opportunity or something. But <laughs> yeah. reality TV is just like not. It's not what I do. It's on TV. That's the only similarity is that it's on a screen. You know what I mean? And so like, other than that, I can. I can get entertainment and it is in no way like challenging to me in a good way. It's not, and, and stim slash it's not that stimulating. It's like, I am observing a thing I kind of have no control over. And, and although I feel stakes, it's ultimately irrelevant in my life. Like, like sports are for, for most people, you know? <laughs> I love it, man. I love sports. And yeah. whoever edits a lot of it is just has a very dark sense of humor. Yeah, it's the editors, man. <laughs> it's just like... It's Im yeah. I would imagine it's impossible not to grow to hate the people that you are editing if you are one of the editors working on these shows. <laughs> and, it, and it does come through. I feel like you yeah. get to know the personalities, yeah, of the people <laughs> editing the show through watching the shows. And you're like, oh, they hate this person. Yeah. <laughs> 90 Day, man. We got to watch that one time, cuz. I do. I've not... Oh. Yes. Oh. You I've seen never seen it. No, I've never seen. I would never watch that, bro. You're so next level, yeah. and uh, we appreciate you. We need you, man. We, yeah. we, we, you're, you're one of those guys we got to protect at all times and, and at all costs. <laughs> For real. Thank you so much, True. man. I, it's an True. honor to talk to you every time. I'm uh, honestly, yeah, you're uh, a huge influence in my life and my work, and uh, so I appreciate it at all. At, I appreciate being considered. Thank you so much for having me. Listen, at some point, though, <laughs> yeah, at some point, we got to do something together. I don't know what that is, oh, but yeah. I would. Love I would to totally work with agree. You. I would love to, man. Uh, there's a. I, I have a few too. ideas. Let me hit you up. I want. I want it to be a good one. So I. Uh, okay, cool. I, I, I'll, I'll make sure it's a goodie. Okay. <laughs> Please oh, consider wow. it done. Wow. Yeah. Awesome, man. Right. Uh, okay. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it.